Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Norman Patterson. I'm a Christian evangelist. Um, by Christian, I mean that I believe in the authority of the Word of God. The only authority that we have as Christians is what God has revealed to us in the Word of God. So I always start out by telling people that being a Christian, that means that my authority is the Word of God. It's not my opinion, and my duty is to just come down and tell people all about Jesus Christ based upon the Scriptures. And by a Christian evangelist, what I mean by that <coughs> is that I believe that there's only one God. <coughs> he said in the Ten Commandments, the First Commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that there's only one God. There's not a multitude of gods. There's only one God, and the God of the Bible claims to be the one and only true God that has revealed himself in the pages of the scriptures. And so that's my authority here today. I'm not representing any denomination, just representing Jesus Christ as an ambassador, as an evangelist in hopes that somebody will hear the Word of God being preached, and perhaps want to stop and talk. I have free Bibles for anybody who's interested. There's no cost or obligation. There's also some other literature that you're welcome to take if you'd like. And as I was saying, as a, as a Christian, I believe that there is only one true God. What I'm preaching is the historic faith. <coughs> Looking over my shoulder is Noah Webster. And I'm just preaching the same faith that Noah Webster preached. Many people don't know that Noah Webster actually was a Christian. He's a very strong Christian. Did you know that Noah Webster actually made a version of the Bible himself? He uh, took the King James Bible and he tried to make it more understandable. If you know anything, this is Blueback Square. That has is a tribute to Noah Webster. So I'm preaching the same faith that Noah Webster preached. And now I got the stone one behind me, I can tell you that the real Noah Webster, if he could see me, is smiling down upon me because I'm preaching the same faith that uh, Noah Webster believed in. And he believed in the one and only true God who revealed himself in the pages of his infallible and own scripture. And that's the authority. That's why that's why Noah Webster took him. He made a version of the Bible himself. Um, you can look it up. You can buy it on Amazon. I have a copy myself. It's called the Webster Bible. Um, and the reason he did that, as I was just saying, is because there's a lot of strange words in the King James. <coughs> and so Noah Webster, being the educated man that he was, he determined to make the Bible more accessible to uh, the common people. And so he did a translation. I'm kind of wishing I brought my Noah Webster translation down here today just to verify what I'm saying. That Noah Webster was a Christian man. And he believed that the purpose of learning to read and the purpose of education is so that we could teach our young people all about the truths that we find in the Holy Scriptures. And so... So, you know, my authority is not Noah Webster this morning. My authority is the Bible. And it's the same Bible that Noah Webster believed in. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if Noah Webster were here today, I promise you he would be standing here with me as a man of Christian faith, the man who believed in the one and only true God who revealed himself in the pages of the Bible as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Noah Webster, as far as I can tell, believed in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he believed that Jesus Christ was truly God, was fully God and fully man. <clears throat> that Jesus Christ was um, the Son of God and the Son of Man. That's what good old Noah Webster believed in. And so, I hope that you take time to not just learn about the uh, faith of Noah Webster, but you would also learn... Uh, about the history of Noah Webster, but I hope that you will take time to actually learn the faith of this great man, this man who believed in Jesus Christ 
and he followed Jesus Christ, and he um, had a time in his life when he um, trusted in Christ alone for salvation. So as I got Noah Webster looking over my shoulder, I can tell you that I'm here preaching the same message, the same faith that good old Noah Webster proclaimed. And I can tell you proudly that Noah Webster, you know, here he is a stone figure. If, if you can look down, if he was able to look down from heaven, you, I can tell you that Noah Webster would be saying, good job, Norman. You're doing a good job because you're proclaiming the faith that I believed in, the one and only true faith. <laughs> And that faith that Noah Webster believed in, that I believe in today, there's other great men from Connecticut. Most people don't know that Jonathan Edwards was from Connecticut. He was born not far from here, I believe it was in Windsor. Uh, sadly, most Americans don't even know who Jonathan Edwards is. They don't really know who Noah Webster is. But Jonathan Edwards was also a man of faith. And I'm proclaiming that same faith that, Noah, uh, that uh, Jonathan Edwards proclaimed Many years ago, a man from Connecticut, and then <coughs> he was a pastor up in Northampton, Connecticut, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, I'm sorry. And then after that, he was a missionary to the Mohawk Indians. In fact, um, we have a lot of preservation of the language of the Mohawk Indians because Jonathan Edwards, while he was a missionary to the Mohawk Indians, his son played with the Mohawk Indian children, and so his son became very prolific and um, adept at understanding and speaking the Mohawk language. And many people came to know Christ in the Mohawk tribes because of the work of Jonathan Edwards during that time. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I, I mean, I am here to talk about the same faith that, that Jonathan Edwards had, that Noah Webster had. <coughs> And that faith can be found in the pages of the scriptures. And so, I'd like to uh, read some passages of scripture. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 7, in the scripture that says, Do not judge, so that you will not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. So the first thing I want to talk about in Matthew chapter 7 is the concept of judging, and that's a having a heart that just thinks that they're better or yet that you're better than anyone else. <laughs> you see, the Bible says that um, we are all equal on the, on the foot of the cross. We all stand before God, and if it's the Bible who judges. It's not our place to judge one another. And when a person brings to us what the Word of God says about the righteousness of God, that's not a form of judgment. That's a, that's a form of God's judgment, but not the form of human judgment. In fact, it says in chapter 7, verse 12 of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, judge with the judgment of righteousness. <clears throat> you see, if you're judging somebody according to your own standard and you think <coughs> excuse me, that you're better than someone else, then the Bible is a mirror that you can look at and look into and really get a good look and glimpse of your own heart. Because the Bible says that the human heart is desperately wicked. The human heart is against God. <clears throat> In fact, the Bible says that there is none righteous. No, not one. I mean, just to say that there is none righteous, then um, it is emphasized in the book of, I think it's um, Isaiah chapter uh, 53, that there's none righteous before God. Because ultimately speaking, <coughs> God is the ultimate judgment. And it's only according to His Word. And all we have to do is take time to open up His Word to be able to see what we're like and what our hearts are like. And our hearts, according to the Bible, in Ezekiel chapter 36, the Bible says that the human heart is like a stone. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, 
it says that what has to happen is that the Spirit of God must take away our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. <clears throat> and the imagery of that in the uh, prophet of Ezekiel is that we have dead hearts. We have stony hearts. <clears throat> Unless the Holy Spirit of God does a supernatural work in our lives, then we are stuck with a stony heart. We cannot regenerate our own hearts. We cannot do a cardiectomy on ourselves. It must be the work of God Almighty upon our lives. And so Ezekiel tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked. Actually, he says that we have stony hearts. And so that's why it says, do not judge. Because we don't have the authority as human beings um, just to walk around judging one another. But then it says, <coughs> it says a warning. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And what measure you measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? There's also free Bibles if you'd like one too. You're welcome to it. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? You see, every human being, we have logs in our eyes. In other words, we're really blind. We can't truly see clearly in order to render a righteous judgment upon another human being. And so the only way that we could get rid of that, that log that's in our own eyes is for us to um, <coughs> submit ourselves to the authority of, of the written word of God. And that's what we have in the scriptures. The scriptures, and I say this often when I go out street preaching, the scriptures are the greatest book that has ever been written. And it's very sad how few Americans have actually taken time to read the Bible in its entirety. I have people that will walk by and say that the Bible is a bunch of BS. And then I ask them one question. I ask, have you ever read it? And they'll say, no. I mean, what kind of educated opinion is somebody, does somebody have when they talk about a book that they've never read? If I told you that, you know, a book by Stephen King or James Patterson was a bunch of garbage, and you asked me if I read it, and I said no, you would say, by what authority? I mean, your, your testimony is not credible. I have free Bibles for anybody who would like them. <clears throat> There's no cost or obligation. I'm not selling anything. But if you would like a Bible, you don't have one. I suggest that you take a Bible and take some time to actually read it. There was a time in the United States of America when every child, every adult was familiar with the Word of God. And that's, that was something that was a miracle because before that time, the Bible was only kept amongst the uh, Roman priest and the Roman... What's that? What's that? Yeah, that's what I was just saying, that people haven't even read the Bible that render an opinion. That's not an educated opinion. So if you've actually read it and you want to say that and tell me why, you, if you've read it from Genesis chapter 1 out through Revelation chapter 22, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. And let alone understand it. So that lady, you know, she's walking by and saying that the Bible's BS is exactly what I was just saying. She's never even taken time to read the Bible, so she doesn't even know what she's talking about. <coughs> so the only way that we could get a true rendering of what we're like, you can't get your true rendering of what you're like from another human being. I mean, another human being does not have the right to render judgment on your heart because it's only God that knows the heart. Nobody else can see inside of you. Nobody else can see your motivations. Nobody else can really tell what's going on in another person's heart. <coughs> and so that's why the Bible tells us not that we don't have the right to judge 
one another, but it's only God that sees our hearts. It's only the Word of God that tells us accurately the state and condition of the human heart. And the state and condition of the human heart, the Bible says, is that it's desperately wicked. The Bible does render judgment upon the human heart. The Bible says that the human heart is desperately wicked. Who could know it? It says that there's none righteous, no, not one. And so the Bible tells us also how we can get rid of our sinful hearts. And that's only something that God ultimately can do. <coughs> it's a supernatural work of the Spirit of God upon our lives that He must do. <coughs> and that's why it says, do not judge. Let the, let the Word of God judge. Let, let the Bible be the judgment. Let God do the judging of what is right and what's wrong. <coughs> and that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, one of the things that happened is that Adam and Eve judged for themselves and determined for themselves what was right and was what was wrong. They became a standard unto themselves, and instead of listening to what God says is right and what's wrong, they went by human opinion. And as soon as you leave right and wrong, good and evil, to human opinion, that becomes a very dangerous thing because we all have different opinions about what is right and what is wrong. So the question must be not what is my opinion about what is right and what's wrong. It must be what is God's what God what, what does God claim to be that which is right and that which is wrong. You see, the standard of holiness is God Himself, the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible says that He is holy. <coughs> In fact, it says in 1 John that God is light and in Him is no darkness whatsoever. And the God of the Bible is not the God of Carl Jung. If you ever take time to study Carl Jung, what Carl Jung did is that he just brought to popularity paganism and he tried to make it as if it was scientific. Well, Carl Jung was anything but scientific. Carl Jung was a blatant pagan. In fact, he was, uh, there's a codex of a, of a Gnostic book named after Carl Jung. <clears throat> Carl Jung did not go by what the Word of God says. <coughs> and that's why we must go by what the Scripture says. And the Scripture that tells us, hey, how you doing? Good, thank you. Preach it. I appreciate that, brother. So we must go by what the Bible says, and the fact is, is that since the Bible tells us that the human heart is desperately wicked, since the human heart is evil, since the human heart is dead, since the human heart is hard like stone, it must be a work of God. But the only way that God could make us right with Him, and this is the message of the Gospel, the message of the Gospel is that the only way that we could be made right with a holy God who will not and cannot tolerate sin is for God to make a way for us to be saved. And the only way that God can make a way for us be, to be saved is that the Bible tells us that God Himself became a human being. God Himself became a man. That's the message of biblical Christianity. And sadly, that's not the message that you're going to hear from most churches even here in West Hartford, the glory of the Incarnation. You see, liberal and progressive churches will tell you that Jesus Christ was a myth. That's why they're always searching for the historic Jesus Christ, like the Jesus Seminar. Because they don't care whether Jesus Christ was an actual human being or not, because what they believe in is mythology. But biblical Christianity believes in the truth of the Incarnation. The truth that God became a human being. And we believe as Christians in one God, one God and one God alone. But we also believe that this God is a God of complexity. This God has revealed himself as God the Father, and as God the Son, and as God the Holy Spirit. And that the three persons of the Holy Trinity are equal in power, and equal in glory, and each person of the Trinity is worthy of worship and praise. That's biblical Christianity. And biblical Christianity teaches 
that the only way that God can make a way for our sins to be forgiven is for God to do a supernatural work. And it says in the Bible that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? It means that God had a plan right from the very beginning how he would save sinful humanity. And the only way that God will save sinful humanity is for God himself. How are you doing? Christ is Lord, brother. Because you Praise believe God. that. Amen. Amen, brothers. I'm glad to hear that. And the only way that God can make us right with him is for God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, to become a human being. And that's what happened. When Jesus Christ came into this world, do you remember Christmas time? No, it's not about Frosty the Snowman, and it's not about Santa Claus, and it's not about Christmas trees. It's about the incarnation of God into this world. It is about the incarnation of Jesus Christ into the world. That's the good news of the scriptures. <clears throat> the, <coughs> in the, the book of Isaiah says that uh, the world has seen a great light. And Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. And so the greatest event that has ever happened in all humanity is the reality that God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, came into this world. He was sent by the Father. He was sent by the Father. And when Jesus Christ came into this world, he was one person with two natures. That's called the apostolic union of Jesus Christ. For any of you uh, uh, theophils out there that love theology, the hypostatic union of Christ means that Christ in his being was fully God and fully man. <coughs> and so when we look at the person of Jesus Christ, who existed over 2,000 years ago, the person of Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, was fully God and fully man. How you doing? Okay. You work over here, huh? I do, yes. Yeah, good for you. Any good movies out? Uh, yeah, okay. All right. The, the gospel, the Jesus Christ of the Bible, is fully God and fully man. And so when we hear talk about Jesus Christ, he is talked about as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And that shows his hypostatic union. I know that's a difficult word for people who are indoctrinated in public education. Um, hypostatic union means that Jesus Christ was one person, but he was also fully God and fully man. And that's what the whole incarnation is all about. That's why the Bible is very particular and very clear what happened when Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And she was a virgin when she was when when she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and so he was fully man because Mary was truly his mother, and he was fully God because God the Father was his father, and it continues to be his father. And so when Jesus Christ came into the world, it says in the book of of the Gospel of John that Jesus Christ showed us, revealed to us who God is. And so if you want to know what God is like, a lot of people say, I wonder what God is like. Well, all you have to do is take a look at Jesus Christ, and you have a perfect picture of who God the Father is. In fact, Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And when Jesus Christ came into this world, he was a representation of all humankind, of all mankind. And this is very important in the message of the Gospel. And the message of the Gospel is that when Jesus Christ came into this world who was fully God, he was also fully man, and he was a representation of all mankind, of all humankind, in the same way that Adam was a representation of all mankind. And the Bible says, just as sin entered the world because of one man's sin, talking about Adam, and that's why we are all sinners, is because we're all children of Adam, we're all children of Adam and Eve. And every child of Adam and Eve is born physically alive, but spiritually dead. That's what I was saying earlier. <clears throat> Human beings, because we have Adam's sin, we are born into this world with sinful hearts. We walk around physically alive, and that's what you're able to do today. That's why you need water. That's why you are breathing. That's why your heart is beating. It's because you have physical life. But the Bible says that we're born into this world. We are spiritually dead. We have hearts of stone. The heart is desperately wicked. 
And how is it that we could come into the presence of the one and only true, holy, Trinitarian God? We cannot come into his presence in and of ourselves. That's part of the message of the gospel. And that's what John was talking about in 1 John when he said, God is light and in him is no darkness whatsoever. You see, if you are not in Christ and you were to go before and stand in the presence of God Almighty, God would say to you, depart from me because God is so how holy, God is so righteous that he cannot and will not allow sinful human beings into his presence. And God is also just. That's what it means to say that God is righteous. It means that God is a righteous judge. And only God ultimately, speak, ultimately judges with the judgment of righteousness. Only God is the one that knows our motives and our hearts absolutely and perfectly. And so God has told us as human beings that we have desperately wicked hearts. And so the plan of salvation that God has given us, I have free Bibles if you would like one. I have free Bibles for anybody. <clears throat> the plan of salvation <coughs> that God has given us is that God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, would come into this world, would be incarnate. The word carn means flesh, and so incarnation means the infleshation of Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus Christ was walking on the face of this earth, he was fully God and he was fully man. And the beauty of Jesus Christ and the uniqueness of the Christian message is that Jesus Christ never sinned. In fact, in the Bible, Jesus Christ never sinned before God. He kept the law of God absolutely and perfectly. That's because in his nature, he did not have a sinful heart like you and I when babies are born into the world. And I'm, I'm a dad. I'm, I have five kids. I just had, my wife just had a baby three months ago, and here I am at 60 years old. A brand new dad, and I love my son so much, I can't even tell you how much I love this little guy. But I also know that his little heart is hard towards God. He's physically alive, and I pray that the Spirit of God would do a work, because that's the connect condition of the human heart. And unless God does something, and that's what the gospel, the word gospel, most Americans <clears throat> who are indoctrinated in public schools don't even know that what the word gospel means. The word gospel is from a Greek word which means good news. And so when somebody like me today is preaching the gospel, the euangelion in the, in the language of Greek, the euangelion is actually a Greek word which means the good message or the good proclamation. <coughs> And so preaching the gospel is bringing the good news. And the good news is that God has not left us, in the, left this world in sin. The good news of biblical Christianity is that God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, and God the Father sent his only begotten Son into this world so that we could have a way of salvation. And so Jesus Christ lived the perfect life. Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. He was not a myth, as progressive Christians would say. Jesus Christ actually lived and walked on the face of this, this earth. In fact, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said that I saw Jesus Christ. I touched Jesus Christ. I talked to, to Jesus Christ. I looked into the eyes of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is true and Jesus Christ is real and over 2,000 years ago God himself walked on the face of the earth you know I do you know that the, the most photographed footprint in all the, of history is it's the first footprints that was taken when the man went on the moon who was that Neil Armstrong when he walked on the earth, on the on the moon well the greatest footprint that ever was made was when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is fully God and fully man, walked on the face of this earth. That was the greatest footprints that was ever made in all of history. And his footprints and his feet were pure, and his hands were pure, and his eyes were pure, and his heart was pure. You see, Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, who walked on this earth over 2,000 years ago, he was 100% pure. He was 100% holy. He kept all the law of God. 
all the Ten Commandments, all 613 mikvah. Jesus Christ kept them absolutely perfectly. And why is that important? It's important because when Jesus Christ finally went to the cross, He went to the cross as an innocent man, as a representation of all humankind. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, Jesus Christ went as an innocent man. He was not guilty, 100% not guilty. And I often say it, that even Pontius Pilate, who was the civil magistrate of the Roman Empire, who was presiding over his trial, and the reason he had to do that is because the Jews were having their own trial. The Sanhedrin had their own trial. They had to bring in a bunch of false witnesses in order to try to um, render Jesus Christ guilty. And there was nothing that he could say. He did claim to be the Son of God, but that was not blasphemy because he was absolutely telling the truth. <clears throat> and so because the Sanhedrin did not have the power of the death penalty, <coughs> because the Sanhedrin did not have the power of the death penalty, they had to go to the Roman Empire. How are you doing? It's free Bibles if you would like one. I have free Bibles for anybody who would like one. No cost or obligation. They're there. They're here for free. They're decent Bibles as King James. And so, as I was saying, the, the Sanhedrin of, of Israel did not have the power to proclaim a death sentence upon Jesus Christ. It was only the Roman Empire. I have free Bibles if anybody would like one. And uh, different literature, you're welcome to take one. No cost or obligation. If you're educated people, I hope you've read the Bible. Have you read the Bible? Yeah, you haven't. Don't lie. <laughs> you know you haven't. Educated people have read the Bible. It's the greatest book in all of Western civilization. And so if you want to be an educated person, read the Bible. And as I was saying, the Sanhedrin did not have the power to proclaim Jesus Christ and proclaim the death penalty. And so they had to go to the Roman Empire, and Pontius Pilate was a representation of the Roman Empire. And so even Pontius Pilate declared that Jesus Christ was absolutely innocent before, before um, everybody. Jesus Christ was not guilty. And that's important because when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he was not guilty in his heart. He had a pure heart when he went to the cross. And not only that, Jesus Christ had clean hands. There was no sin in Jesus Christ whatsoever. And so, <laughs> and why this is so important, why am I belaboring this point? I'm belaboring this point because when Christ went to the cross, God the Father punished Jesus Christ on the behalf of sinners. That's why the Bible says, for God commended his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, while we were yet sinners, God didn't wait until we cleaned ourselves up. We can't clean ourselves up. You see, human beings are slaves to, slaves to sin. And people wonder whether we have free will or not. We do have free will, but the problem is that with wicked and sinful hearts, all you're going to choose is sinfulness. That's all you can choose. That's, all, that's the only options you have. We don't have the ability to choose righteousness. I have free Bibles for anybody who would like one. You're welcome to take any literature here. <clears throat> and so when Christ went to the cross, what happened there is that God the Father poured out his wrath upon Jesus Christ for the sin that sinners committed. You see, that's why it's so, so important that Jesus Christ was innocent because when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he was punished. The innocent one was punished on behalf of guilty ones. Jesus Christ was absolutely innocent when he went to the cross. And when God the Father punished Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners, Jesus Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ the holy one, that means that the punishment of Jesus Christ who was innocent for the sins of all those God intends to save was efficacious. And I know that's a difficult word for public indoctrinated people. Efficacious means it set out to do, it did what it set out to do. 
And so God the Father punished Jesus Christ, the innocent one, on the cross. He poured out his wrath towards sin. You could see just how wicked and awful that human sin is by taking a look at the cross because there on the cross, the innocent Jesus Christ, the innocent Son of God, the innocent Holy One of Israel was punished. And for all that time, I think, what was it, like six hours, maybe even before that, where Jesus was scourged, um, he was punished in the wrath of God towards sin. The punishment of God towards sin was poured out upon Jesus Christ. And why is that important? It is important because when you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, then Jesus Christ becomes a substitute for you, which means that Jesus Christ died on the cross on behalf of of all those who put their trust and their hope in Him. <clears throat> and so if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that means that He acts as a sacrifice for you. That means that his, your sin has been taken away by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what happened on the cross. And that's not what's being preached. <clears throat> I have to tell you, that's not what's being preached from this church right down here. I guarantee you, you go down on a Sunday morning and show up, you're not going to hear about the substitutionary atonement and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You're just going to hear about clappy, clappy stuff. But the Bible tells us that, For God so loved the world, John 3.16, which is the most known scripture in all the Bible, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and so God is love, absolutely, but the love of God takes action. And how did the love of God take action? For God so loved the world that He gave. God the Father gave His only begotten Son. God gave His very best. You see, the only way that sin could be dealt with, the only way that sin could be forgiven, is for God the Father to give Jesus Christ, His only Son, on the cross. And so Jesus Christ is the, the Son, the only begotten Son of God, dying on the cross and being punished on behalf of sinners. That's how much God loves us. God loves us so much that the only way that our sins could possibly be forgiven is for God Himself, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and take the punishment of our sin upon Him. And the good news, the uh, good news of Jesus Christ is <clears throat> that if you put your faith and your hope this day in Jesus Christ, that God can and will forgive you of your sin. He will take away your sin. <coughs> because if you trust in Him, over 2,000 years ago, God the Father punished Jesus Christ on behalf of all of those for all of time who would put their hope and their trust in Him. And so today, if you put your hope and your trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that means God the Father will look upon Jesus Christ as your substitutionary atonement, as the one who has died in your place, as the one who was punished in your place. That's what biblical Christianity is. It's the belief that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died as a substitute for us on the cross. And so the message of the good news of Jesus Christ is that all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation will have forgiveness of sins because God dealt with your sin upon the cross of Jesus Christ. And the exchange that happens, and this again is biblical Christianity, it's not, the, it's not the church unity that you're going to hear in these happy, clappy, rainbow churches. Biblical Christianity is all about how God the Father poured out His wrath on God the Son on behalf of sinners. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but even have eternal life. And that even John 3.16 says that if you're not in Christ then we will face God someday and we'll be eternally condemned to hell. How you doing? Good. I got free Bibles if you want one. Good. Good. All right. 
You see, the wrath of God was visited upon Jesus Christ. He was punished. And if you trust in Him, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. I've seen you before, haven't I? Yeah. Yeah, you go by once in a while. Yeah, you can take whatever one you want. Sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, take, take, help yourself. <clears throat> and some people get offended when you talk about the wrath of God. I mean, you know, I mean, Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon. It was actually a pretty good sermon, and most people don't even know who Jonathan Edwards was. The greatest theologian that America has ever produced. I studied him in my philosophy class at Central Connecticut State University, and even my secular humanistic professors had to acknowledge that Jonathan Edwards was the greatest philosopher that the United States has ever produced. And Jonathan Edwards, the, one of the keenest minds that you could ever find, <coughs> preached in Enfield, Connecticut, a sermon that was entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But you see, now in our day, we have God in the hands of angry sinners. Jonathan Edwards, way back, way back when, several hundred years ago, talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God because he was preaching about the God of the Bible. You see, the God of the Bible doesn't just wink at sin. The God of the Bible, it says that he continually remains true to who he is, and that means that his attitude towards sin never changes. You see, modern churchianity Happy, clappy churches are trying to tell you that God has finally changed his mind, that God finally came to his senses and is trying to tell everybody that what he once said was sin is no longer sin. Well, that's ridiculous. The Bible says that God does not change. I have free Bibles if anybody would like one. You see, one of the doctrines of the Bible, in theological terms, how are you doing? You can take a free Bible if you want one. <coughs> one of the doctrines of the Bible, as we study God, Theology is the study of God, and that is the queen, uh, the king of all the sciences. The Bible says that God is immutable. God is immutable. And I know that's a big word, again, for people who went through public indoctrination centers called public schools. The immutability of God means that God does not change. The immutability of God means that God does not change. <coughs> the God of the Bible does not change whatsoever. That's one of the qualities of God. If you've ever taken time to study the Bible, the God of the Bible does not change. He is the same when he, uh, right from all time of who he is. And God has not changed his mind on human sexuality. God has not changed his mind on marriage. God has not changed his mind on what sin is. And sin is defined in the Bible as a transgression of God's law, particularly the Ten Commandments. You see, the Ten Commandments, it says um, in 1 John, I think it's chapter 4, verse 20, that the sin is defined as a transgression of God's law. And that God's law is found in the Ten Commandments. And I bet you, you can't even find uh, an American who could name five of the Ten Commandments. Could you? Sure. Give me five. Uh, no, nope. that's not one of them. Uh, no Good. Holy. Good. Good. Uh, Good. One more. Go it. You got it. I'm impressed. No, Norman. 
Norman Patterson. Yeah, good job, sir. I'm very, very impressed. Very good. X is 20, but you're, you're very good. You had the right book, and 20 is good. Excellent, excellent. You get an A for today. God bless you too, sir. <coughs> Most Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. When Noah Webster was here, I could tell you the Americans knew it because it was taught in the schools of his day. This guy here behind me, he knew and understood the Ten Commandments, and one of the reasons that he made the blueback speller, that blueback square, most people don't even know that, blueback square is named after Noah Webster's blueback reader. One of the reasons that Noah Webster wanted people to read and wanted children to read is so that they could read and understand God's Word. <clears throat> and you can bet the children of Noah Webster's day read the Bible and they read the Ten Commandments and they understood that transgression of God's law is sin. And all the Ten Commandments. And the Bible tells us that we all have broken the commandments of God. I mean, the Ten Commandments are very basic and very easy. <clears throat> Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Thou shalt not um, profane the name of God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. Those are the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments could be further summarized. And it was summarized in the Shema. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy strength, and the neighbor, our neighbor as ourselves. You can even say that the commandment of God is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. you. See, but the Bible tells us that we've all broken God's law. <clears throat> and because we've all broken God's law, that means we all need the salvation of Jesus Christ. You see, biblical Christianity... <clears throat> And I differentiate biblical Christianity from churchianity that you have in most of the churches here in the United States of America, particularly here in West Hartford. You see, biblical Christianity is true. Biblical Christianity tells us of the way of salvation. Biblical Christianity is founded upon the only authoritative word of God, the inerrant in infallible Word of God, the self-authenticating Word of God. That's what the, the Bible tells us, is that it's self-authenticating and it tells us everything that we need to know of who God is. It tells us the way of salvation. <clears throat> and so people are going out today, you're thinking about what you want to buy, what you're thinking about in your life. <laughs> but the Bible in Matthew chapter 7, and I've gotten away from it, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. <clears throat> Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. You see, God is the one, first of all, that comes to us and initiates salvation. And unless the Lord God himself initiates salvation, we are lost for all time. But the Bible tells us that if we seek God, we can find him. But there's none that actually seek God. It has to be the work of God upon our hearts because none of us go after God. We don't care about God. All we care about is ourselves. And biblical Christianity is the only true faith that tells you the way of salvation. And the way of salvation is only through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. What a powerful statement that Jesus Christ made that day, that I am the way. You see, there's not many ways to God. In progressive churchianity, they're trying to tell you that there are many ways to God. But Jesus said, I am the way. The, the article is right there in the Greek, and it's very definitive that Jesus Christ didn't claim to just be one way among other ways. Jesus Christ, have you ever seen a street preacher, sir? 
Jesus Christ didn't say that he is a way. Jesus Christ claimed to be the way. In other words, Jesus Christ is making absolute claims of who he is. And so when you look at Jesus Christ, you have to either fall down on your knees and worship him and trust in him alone for salvation, or you need to reject him outright. Because Jesus said, I am the way. <coughs> in fact, he's going to nail that <laughs> down when he says, nobody comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way to be made right with God Almighty except for Jesus Christ. Oh yes, that's what I was going to say before. Biblical Christianity is the only religion that is grace-based. This is what makes Biblical Christianity different than every other religion. It's grace-based. The word grace, it means unmerited favor. It means something that must be done on our behalf that we cannot do ourselves and that we do not deserve. That's what grace is. <clears throat> And gra the grace of God, <clears throat> the grace of God is found, ultimately speaking, in Jesus Christ. The Bible, right from the very beginning, is always pointing to the day when Jesus Christ would come. The grace of God in our lives and in our world. <coughs> and so Jesus said, I am the way. <coughs> and that means, biblical Christianity makes exclusive claims. Biblical Christianity is not going to tell you that you can find God and be saved through any other way. Biblical Christianity makes exclusive claims found and focused. What's that, sir? Biblical Christianity makes exclusive claims that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, that Jesus Christ is God. That's the exclusivity and the absoluteness of who Jesus Christ is. You believe that? Amen. I'm glad to hear that. A lot of people don't believe it, but maybe the Holy Spirit will touch them. God knows. You're right. You're very right. <clears throat> you see, but biblical Christianity makes exclusive claims. And what you're getting in, in liberal and progressive churches nowadays is a form, a watered-down form of churchianity. It's not Christianity. They, they may use the name of Jesus, they may talk about Jesus, but Paul strictly warns people that there would come in the latter times when people would be preaching another Christ. Another Christ. And the church right down here and many of the churches here in West Hartford, <coughs> Hartford and so forth are preaching another Christ because they do not believe that Jesus Christ lived over 2,000 years ago. They did not believe that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. They did not believe in the full incarnation of God. They did not believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they do not believe in the scriptures that tells us the truth of who God is and the way of salvation. They believe that the Bible is just a book among books. They do not believe in the inerrancy, in the infallibility, in the self-authentication of the Bible itself. <coughs> and I have free Bibles for anybody who would like one. I have free Bibles for anybody who would like a free Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you've never read it, then what's wrong? Why, why do you not have a Bible? Here they are for free. You can pick them up off of Amazon for a couple of bucks, you can pick one up here today for free. You see, that's what Jesus Christ is telling us. To ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. And, it, and, and knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open to you. Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or what if he asks for a fish will he not give him a snake? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you what is good to those who ask him? Therefore in all things, whatever you want people to do for you, so do for them. For this is the law and the prophets. And then Jesus Christ says, Enter through the narrow gate. And who's the narrow gate? 
Jesus Christ is the narrow gate. I got free Bibles, guys. If you want one, you're welcome to take one. <coughs> you should do it. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. And so, who is the narrow gate? Jesus Christ is that narrow gate. Let me turn the page. He says, For the gate is narrow, and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You see, Jesus Christ claims to be the life. There's life in Jesus Christ. He not only claimed to be the light of the world, he also claimed to be living waters. And if you wanted to have living waters spring up in your soul, then trust in Christ alone for your salvation. <clears throat> you see, he talks about the narrow way, because <coughs> salvation is a narrow subject. It is a narrow subject because it is limited to the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what biblical Christianity is all about. You see, false churchianity that you see being proclaimed in happy, clappy churches, they're going to tell you that why is the way that leads to salvation. But Jesus Christ didn't say that. He says the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it. And I'm here today to help you find it, to help you find life in Jesus Christ. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And when the rain descended and the rivers came and the winds blew, and fell against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And the rock Jesus was talking about was himself. Because if your life is built upon anything other than Jesus Christ, what happens when the storms come, financial ruin comes, what happens to you? People fall apart. When people get cancer, what happens to them? They fall apart. When a loved one dies, what happens to them? They fall apart. When something happens that's terrible in life, what happens? People fall apart. The reason they fall apart is because their lives are built upon something other than the rock of Jesus Christ. You see, when you put your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ, you can take everything away from a Christian. And there are Christians throughout history that have had everything taken away from them. <clears throat> Their lives, their livelihoods, their loved ones, their health, they've been tortured in the name of Jesus Christ. But even though it was very painful and very difficult, they did not buckle and they did not fold. I'm thinking about a man named Richard Warmbrand. Richard, Richard Warmbrand was a man who was under communist uh, Soviet Union in Romania. He was a pastor there. And one day they came and they arrested Richard Warmbrand, and they stuck him in prison, and they, uh, see what an open mind she has? An educated person allows for the education and promulgation of all ways. Sadly that you have a narrow mind and you're intolerant. How very sad. See, what she's telling you is don't listen, because she's intolerant, and she's unloving. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So Richard Warmbrand was a pastor under Soviet Union in Romania, um, Soviet Union. And they tried to torture him to deny Jesus Christ, and he would not do that. For 14 years, this man went un underwent some of the most wicked and terrible tortures known to humankind. It was a horrific thing. And all he had to do in order to escape the torture from the Soviet regime was to denounce Jesus Christ. And this great man... Richard Warmbrand would not deny Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because his life was built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And if your rock, if your life is built upon your finances, all it takes is your stock market to crash. I mean, in 1930, all the people that committed suicide because the stock market crashed, that's because their life and their livelihood and their salvation was in their money. <coughs> And what happens someday, if you get the news that you have cancer, 
and that you only have a couple of weeks to live or months to live, what's going to happen to you? Then you're going to start thinking about the important things of life. Today, you're not thinking about the important things of life. Why not? You see, your life could be taken away at any moment. Your finances could be taken away at any moment. I had a cousin when I was growing up. You see, that poor woman, she, she could have walked into that car. God bless you, lady, that you didn't get hit by the car. But that also shows that our lives are so fragile. All it takes is one misstep, one accident in our life, and then we're standing in the presence of God. And Jesus Christ asks the question, what's your life founded upon? Is it your physical health? All it takes is a doctor's report. All it takes is for you to find out that you have cancer or some life-threatening disease. All it takes is stepping into the car and a bus running you over. All it takes is for the stock market to crash. All it takes is for a thief to come into your home. All it takes is for a strange person to take your life. What's your life worth? What's your life worth? What's eternity worth to you? What is your life worth? built upon. Jesus Christ said, if your life is built upon anything other than Him, what's going to happen is the storms of life are, are going to come and they're going to hit you hard. And anybody that has lived long enough, I mean, there's kids that have suffered, believe me. They've lost their mom and dad. They've lost friends. They've lost their health. But I've lived 60 years of my life and I can tell you that life can hit you hard sometimes. And if your life is built upon the love of another person, if your life is built upon how much money you have, if your life is built upon your intellect, if your life is built upon your physique, if you're like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've been watching the special by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, when he was young, his whole foundation of his life was built upon his body as he posed as Mr. Universe and, and Mr. Olympia. What is your life built upon? What is your life worth? You see, it's when the storms of life hit you. And they will hit you, ladies and gentlemen. You may feel really good today and all is great on this beautiful summer day. But all it takes is a moment in time for your life to be completely and utterly changed for all eternity. I mean, for, for the rest of your life. <coughs> and Jesus Christ tells us, don't put your hope and your trust on things that are passing away. Because the things that are most important in our lives are the things that endure. They are eternal things. People aren't thinking about eternal things this day. You're thinking about going to the, the nice little um, festival there. But all it takes is one thing in your life. All it takes is one mistake. All it takes is one storm. All it takes is one fool driving the car like an idiot and smash into your car. That's all it takes. And it doesn't matter whether you're young or old. People die as infancy, in infancy. People die as little boys and little girls. People die as teenagers. People die in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s and their 50s and their 60s. This body that you have right now is a temporary body and it's not going to last. So why not think about the things that will last, the things that will matter? And so Jesus Christ said to build your life upon Him, to trust in Him alone for salvation. And so I'm calling upon you today, this day, to put your life in, in the hands of Jesus Christ, to trust Him alone for salvation. So I'm going to quit preaching now, pick it up again in a few minutes, and I'll talk with anyone. I have free Bibles for anybody who would like a Bible. Um, there's no cost or obligation to you. You're welcome to have one. And um, I'm here if there's any questions about life, about salvation, about how to become a Christian. <laughs>